<laughs> yeah, no, no problem. Read teleprompter. Be conversational. Um, what is this? Here we go, everybody. Buckle in. Welcome to FX9 101. I'm Katie Alenecki, and I work at Sony's Digital Media Production Center, a tech stage in Los Angeles, California that we lovingly call the DMPC. We are going to cover basic setup of your FX9 as if you were prepping your camera for a shoot. If after this video you want to go even deeper into the various settings, knobs, and buttons, you can check out more FX9 snippets on SonyCine.com. Everything we're going to talk about today is FX9 version 3. Once this video is in the world, it is what it is. I want to start with our most important menu and choose our shooting mode. The shooting mode determines how the camera output and internal recording will function. I'm going to briefly go over the three different versions, but for this particular video, we're going to focus on Cine EI mode to match the Venice workflow, Sony's flagship high-end cinema camera. If you go to the side of the camera, push menu once. You can use either the arrows in the set button, or you can use the multi-function dial. Scroll to project, base setting, and shooting mode. There are three options available, SDR, HDR, and Cine EI. SDR stands for Standard Dynamic Range. This option bakes in a flavor of 709, whether it be S Cinetone or 709 800%. Many times this option is used when delivering straight to live television or if you have a very small window for post-production and not enough time for color grading. HDR mode stands for High Dynamic Range. This setting is used when you are delivering HLG. Just like SDR, there are various flavors of HDR. FX9 specifically bakes in HLG, also known as hybrid log gamma. Cine EI mode operates more similarly to a film camera. This is meant for a more traditional film post-production workflow where your footage will be processed in post. Everything captured will be log, which gives you the ability to deliver in different color spaces, whether it be SDR or HDR. FX9 has three internal recording codecs, XAVC-I or Intra, XAVC-L or Longop, and MPEG-HD422. XAVC-I is the least compressed codec. You are compressing each frame individually. XAVC-L compresses groups of frames. XAVC-I is usually used for your narratives and high-end commercials. XAVC-L gives you longer recording times and is great for shooting things like documentary stuff or wildlife when you need more bang for your buck on your card. MPEG HD is a legacy broadcast codec for our friends who are required to use this codec in their workflow. To choose our codec, let's go to the side of the camera. We push Menu, scroll to Project, Record Format, then Codec. Specifically for FX9, XAVC-I is 10-bit 422, XAVC-L is 10-bit 422 in HD, and 8-bit 420 in 4K. MPEG HD is 8 bit 422. We're going to choose XAVCI. When in Cine EI mode, we want to select our color space and gamut. This will be the color space and gamut of the video output, so the SDIs, HDMI, and the viewfinder. When you go into color grading like DaVinci Resolve, you will need to make a decision for the video output as well. If we go to the side of the camera, we push Menu. Scroll to Project, then Cine EI setting, and then Color Gamut. There are two options, sgamut 3cine slog 3 and sgamut 3 slog 3 We typically refer to these as .cine and sgamut 3 Notice there are no slog 2 options unlike our Alpha Friends or FX9's predecessor, the FS7. I go into this in the FX3 101, so go check that out. When it comes to deciding which color gamut to choose, my next question would be, where are you delivering to? If you plan to deliver an HDR output, then you should probably choose S Gamut 3. If your plan is to do an online deliverable or theatrical P3 or maybe a TV 709, then you should probably choose Dot Cine. If you have no idea where the project's going and you're just hoping to get picked up, then it might be safest to choose S Gamut 3. It'll help you preserve for the future and you can always massage it into an SDR color space later. The frequency of our project might be colloquially referred to as your base frame rate. So when you go into post and drop the footage into your timeline, this is the rate at which your content will play back. From the project menu, scroll to record format, then frequency, then select your frequency slash base frame rate. There are all these different options. We're going to select 2390. FX9's imager is a 6K full frame sensor. The output recording is oversampled to 4K. 
You also have the option to shoot at Super 35. A native resolution of 6K means that even when you punch into the sensor, you maintain a 4K resolution overall. If you go to the side of the camera, from Project menu, then Record Format, scroll to Imager Scan Mode. From here, you can decide what size canvas you would like to record to. Full Frame, Full Frame Crop, Super 35 and Super 16 are your canvas sizes, and the resolution determines how much information you put onto that canvas. Full frame 6K means you are using the full width of the sensor, but remember you will still get a 4K recording onto your media. Full frame crop 5K is 83% of full frame and allows for higher frame rates, which we will get into when we talk about high frame rate. S35 is Super 35, still 4K even though it is a smaller canvas. Full Frame 2K is the same size canvas as Full Frame 6K but HD and allows for higher frame rates. Super 35 2K, again the same canvas size as Super 35 4K but HD and higher frame rates. And finally, Super 16 2K is the smallest imager mode available and HD. Why are there so many choices? Well, Sony made these cameras with lensing in mind. Full frame has always been hot in photography, but when we get into the world of film and video, full frame lensing options can still be pricey and not as easily accessible. Sony has tons of full frame lenses available that many people use with FX9, but there are lots of projects who need hard stop irises and hard stop focus rings. DPs want to use the lenses that they want to use, and many times these lenses vignette at full frame. Luckily with FX9, you can make a quick adjustment and still maintain your 4K output. Speaking of lenses, let's quickly discuss anamorphic lenses and the de-squeeze options available in FX9. From the side of the camera, push Menu, scroll to Monitoring, then Viewfinder setting, then to de-squeeze. There are three options, off or one times de-squeeze for your spherical lenses, and for your anamorphic lenses, you have 1.3 and 2 times. That was my favorite section. Dual ISO is like having two different film stocks in one camera. Dual ISO is achieved in a similar fashion across the board. It's two sets of circuitry on the back of the sensor with a physical switch that changes between the two. FX9's two base ISOs are 800 and 4000. Let's go to the side of the camera. Push menu, then scroll to shooting then ISO Gain EI, then scroll to Base Sensitivity. If you select in on that, you are given two options, 4000 and 800. If you are in SDR or HDR mode, this will read as high and low. Each ISO has a ladder or a range of ISOs within each base. These ISO ranges operate differently depending on which system modes you are in. When in Cine EI mode, the ISOs operate as exposure indexes. It is easiest to describe this like film. When you have one film stock in your camera, you can't just change your reels whenever you want, but you can adjust your exposure index. That metadata gets baked into the file, and when you open it in Catalyst Browse or DaVinci, it will tell you to push or pull however many stops you adjusted on the day. Let's talk about how you can easily adjust your EI on the fly. On the side of the camera, there's an ISO gain switch with the letters L for low, M for middle, and H for high. These can be set from the ISO gain EI menu. The camera automatically defaults to particular EIs depending what base you are in, but you can easily change this. Some shooters like to put their base as the middle switch by scrolling to exposure index M and then selecting their base. In our case, we are at 4,000. Then you can set your high to two stops over by scrolling to exposure index H and setting it to 16,000. And you can set your low to one stop under by navigating to exposure index L and setting it to 2,000. You can also change this by selecting in on the multifunction dial from the home screen on your viewfinder. A gold box will appear. Scroll until the box is highlighting EI, push in, and now you can make a more fine-tuned adjustment. This will update whatever switch you are currently on to the new exposure index value. 
You can easily change between bases by using an assignable button. I like to assign my number two button as the base ISO. We do this by going into menu, then user menu, select assignable button, not to be confused with the assignable dial, which is on the hand grip. Once an assignable button, choose one of the 10 assignable buttons and then select base ISO sensitivity. Now you can quickly change base ISO with a button push. In 4000 mode, you can go as high as 16,000 and as low as 1000. At an 800 base, you can go as high as 3200 and as low as 200. Notice that the two bases of 800 and 4000, the latitude distribution is the same, favoring the shadows at nine stops below and six stops up top. As you toggle between different exposure indexes, the latitude changes. The total latitude of 15 plus stops doesn't change, but the over under latitude does. So when it comes to what base ISO and exposure index to shoot at, it kind of comes down to preference. Let's use the example of a 2000 EI. It kind of falls in the middle of the crossover of the two native ISOs. When in 800 mode, if we adjust to 2000, notice that there is a more even latitude distribution of about seven and a half stops in the highlights and seven and a half in the shadows. Now let's switch to 4000 base and adjust down to 2000. Notice my latitude distribution is now favoring my shadows with 10 stops below and five stops in the highlights. In general, many people shoot at 4000 ISO and use the internal ND. This is most beneficial when shooting nighttime exteriors when you're starving for light. The 800 base is used a lot of times when you're shooting day exteriors like in the snow or the desert and you want to shoot at a 2.8 and there isn't enough internal ND to bring 4000 down to the exposure you're looking for. Everyone does something different. Some people like shooting 800 at night and like how 4000 looks during the day. It is totally preference, so at the end of the day, it is up to you and your eye. Test everything to find your sweet spot. I think that's the longest section, right? Unlike Venice, the FX9 can seamlessly adjust its ND density without interrupting the image, using an electronic variable ND filter. This adjustment is optically based as opposed to using image processing. To engage variable ND, let's go to the side of the camera. First, let's drop the ND in by pushing the plus symbol on the ND filter position buttons. The ND slides into frame and its initial density is two stops. Notice that where it says ND, a fraction appears. This represents light transmittance expressed in fractions of incident light passing through the filter. So one quarter means you are cutting two stops of light, one eighth is three stops, one sixteenth is four stops, and so on. You can decide between using presets or variable. To use presets, set the ND preset variable switch to preset. Then push the plus or minus button to toggle between presets. You can adjust your preset values by going into the menu under shooting, then ND filter, then preset one, two, and three. To enable variable, set the ND preset variable switch to the variable position. You can fine tune the transmittance level by using the variable dial. To enable auto variable ND, push and hold the ND auto button until the indicator light engages. To disengage the ND altogether, push and hold clear to remove the ND. Let's talk about frame rates. Here's a list of imager modes with the frame rates that they max out on. But the most important to note is that you can go as high as 60 frames per second in full frame crop in 4K and as high as 180 frames per second in full frame HD or Super 16 HD. In terms of FX9, high frame rate mode is referred to as slow and quick. 
If we go to the side of the camera, there's a pre-labeled assignable button that says S and Q. By pushing this, the camera goes into slow and quick mode, AKA high frame rate. To adjust the frame rate assigned to the S and Q button, we go into menu, then shooting, scroll to S and Q, then to frame rate. Select the desired FPS. Depending on what image or scan mode you are in, certain frame rates may or may not be available to you. For instance, we are currently in full frame 4K DCI and I can only push the camera to 30 FPS. But by changing my image or scan mode to full frame 2K, I can now go to 180 frames per second. Frame rates, frame rates, frame, frame, frame rates, frame, frame rates. Full frame allows for frame, allows for higher frame rates. Am I saying that weird? Does that sound frame rates? It's, it feels like I'm saying it weird. Let's talk about this magical thing we call S-Cinetone. S-Cinetone expresses the cinematic look cultivated from the color science in Venice, but is tailored for the video world. What does that mean? To better understand this, I wanna give a brief history of 709. Way back when television was invented and broadcast stations started to pop up all over the place, these stations would plant themselves where they saw fit and claim airwaves. This is my airspace. When neighboring stations would plant themselves too close to each other, their airwaves would start to intersect. This caused things like audio bleed over, shows would step on themselves or get super staticky. The government decided to step in and break up the fight by establishing legal limits. So each station was only allowed to stay within their airwaves boundaries, leaving a little buffer before their neighbor's airwaves began. 709 was created to take all the picture information and consolidate it into these legal limits. Nowadays, we don't really have the same issues we once had. 709 takes all the dynamic range and giant color space that these cameras have to offer and smushes it into this legal limit that's kind of antiquated. R709 was the first step towards utilizing more of the picture information available. If regular 709 was 100% of the legal limit, R709 is 800% of the legal limit. So it was a tiny less contrasty and more desaturated, but still the broadcast look. S709 is a new monitoring LUT that came out with the birth of Venice. S709 has a softer contrast and the color is less punchy and slightly less vibrant than the standard 709. S-Cinetone is based on S709 with the intention of bringing a more cinematic look to FX9 by bridging the gap between R709's high contrast and S709's softer contrast. Specifically, S-Cinetone is a little more contrasty in the shadows and a little less contrasty in the highlights. Since highlight contrast is low, the look of highlights is softer. This gives us a more cinematic look. This style was introduced in FX9 and is now included in FX6, FX3, A7S3, and the Alpha 1. Let's go to the side of the camera. To turn on s Cinetone shooting, we have to change the mode of our camera. Scroll to Project, Base Setting, and Shooting Mode. Select SDR. Once the camera's set to SDR, we back out to the main menu. Notice you can now access your Paint menu. Under Paint, we scroll to Gamma, then to Gamma Select. When the Gamma category is set to Standard, Standard 5 is our R709 that we talked about. But for s Cinetone, we want our category to be set to Original. We are now baking in our s Cinetone look. This is usually used when your project is quick turnaround time and you're not planning on grading in post. For the rest of this training, I'm gonna reset the camera to Cine EI mode. I used to think talking about autofocus was crazy and for our photo friends only, never to be used in the video world. This is no longer the case. Today, many of Sony's latest cameras use both phase and contrast-based autofocus. Autofocus is not just in the lens. Fast and precise autofocus is an entire ecosystem working together. Sony combines the technology of the camera and the lens and its AI engine to achieve our industry-leading hybrid autofocus. From the camera side, we have the sensor, the image processor, and the viewfinder. From the lens side, we have the elements, the actuator, and the chassis. The real-time AI defines the speed and subject of the IAF and focus tracking. To enable autofocus, turn it on at the camera and at the lens.
To adjust your autofocus settings, let's go to menu, then to shooting, then to focus. AF transition speed adjusts how quickly or slowly the camera will rack focus. AF subject shift sensitivity adjusts how quickly the camera will react and change focus to a new subject in frame. Focus area sets the target focus area. Focus area and flexible spot sets the target area for push autofocus. Push autofocus can be triggered by pushing the AF button. Face eye detection gives you two options, face eye only and face eye priority. Face eye only means the camera will only grab focus if it sees eyeballs or a face. Face eye priority means that if the camera sees eyeballs or a face, it will grab focus on that first. If it cannot find a face, it will grab focus on the next closest thing in the focus area. For example, if you are shooting an interview in face eye only and the talent takes a drink of water and the glass impedes their face from view, the camera will stop focusing when it loses the talent's face and begin focusing again when the face reappears. If you are shooting in face eye priority and an object obscures the talent's face, the camera may shift focus to the object and then back to the face when the object uncovers the face again. Push AF mode sets the push autofocus mode during manual focus. Touch function in MF sets the action that occurs when the touch screen is tapped during manual focus. Tracking AF is used to touch the screen to track a subject based on not just face or eye, but also color, pattern, or distance. Spot focus is used to throw focus to a particular area in the frame, and you do not want focus to track a subject or item. AF Assist allows you to temporarily override autofocus and set focus manually. FX9 has two SDIs and one HDMI output. SDI 1 is always clean, meaning there are no overlays on the image. This often goes to the director or your DIT when a clean image is needed for external recording or monitoring. SDI 2 can be dirty, meaning you can add overlays and frame lines for monitoring. To add overlays, you go into Menu, then to Monitoring, then Output Display. To turn different items on and off, back out to Display on Off. From this menu, you can toggle between different on-screen items and you can turn them on and off. To turn on a LUT from the main menu, scroll to Shooting, then to Monitor LUT setting. Toggle to Monitor Out, and select M LUT on. The outputs below will update to whether the Monitor LUT is applied or not. To change the viewing LUT, back out to Monitor LUT, scroll to Category, and select LUT. Then back out and scroll to LUT Select, and choose which LUT you would like to view. This is where we can turn on S709. SDI 1 can output 4K, at that point, SDI 2 is turned off because it is now ganging up with SDI 1 to spit out the larger signal. HDMI will simultaneously output 4K. To change your SDI and HDMI output resolution, from the main menu, we scroll to Monitoring, then to Output Formats. From there, you can select available outputs between 1080 and 3840 or 4096, depending on your image or scan mode. It is important to note that we are in 2398 and these are the options available. Availability will vary depending on the frequency you are shooting at. FX9's exposure tools include the Video Signal Monitor and Zebra. The Video Signal Monitor allows you to toggle between waveform, vector scope, or histogram. 
This appears on the viewfinder and on your dirty SDIs. To easily access this, let's assign it to a button. From menu, we go to the user menu, then to assignable button. I like to assign this to button three. You can choose wherever you like. Scroll until you see video signal monitor and select. Now you can toggle through the three options by pushing in on the number three button. A fourth button push turns it off altogether so you can see more of the image while you're recording. Zebra is a quick way to double check your skin tones and your highlights either simultaneously or separately. To turn on Zebra, we can simply push the Zebra button on your viewfinder. To dial in your Zebra settings, we go to Menu, then Monitoring, then Zebra. Zebra Select allows you to choose if you would like to monitor just Zebra 1, just Zebra 2, or both. Zebra 1 is usually skin tones and set to 70% out of the box. Zebra 2 is usually highlights and set to 100% out of the box. Zebra 1 aperture is just your bumper. By default, it is set to 10%. So if you're monitoring skin tones at 70%, the zebra lines will appear anywhere between 65 and 75%. If you're looking for a more narrow margin of error, you can take your aperture to 1%. APR stands for Automatic Pixel Restoration and is something you should perform at least once a day. It corrects dead or lit pixels. You might notice the camera prompting you when you turn it on at the beginning of the day. This is because every 24 hours, the camera sends a reminder if an APR has not been performed within that time frame. When your camera is performing an APR, it is sending out a signal to all the pixels asking, is everybody here? and it's waiting for everyone to respond back with, we're here, we're here, we're here, we're here. If for some reason a pixel doesn't respond, the camera isolates it and turns it off. It then asks the neighboring pixels to give their information to the now dark pixel. So when you go into post, there are no dark or white flecks in the image. Malfunctioning pixels literally happen because of cosmic rays that come down from space and zap our poor unsuspecting sensors. So to perform an APR, push menu, then scroll to technical, then to APR. Be sure to put your lens cap on. Then select execute. It usually takes anywhere between five to 30 seconds. I wanna say that last sentence differently. Black balance is always something important to perform at least once a day. This function sets the black signal values so nothing looks lifted when you go into post. To perform an auto black balance, we push menu, scroll to shooting. From there, scroll all the way to the bottom to auto black balance. Make sure your lens clap is on. Select in, then choose execute. This can take about five to 30 seconds. One of my favorites about the FX9 is Interval Record, AKA time-lapse mode. To turn this on, we go to Menu, then Project, scroll to Interval Record, go to Setting and turn it on. This disables regular recording and you are now in time-lapse mode. Interval Time sets the interval between recordings. You can choose from various time frames in seconds, minutes, or hours. I'm going to choose five seconds. Number of frames sets the number of frames to record per take. The number of frames available will change based on your frequency or your base frame rate. I'm gonna choose one frame. So one frame every five seconds. Pre-lighting sets the number of seconds that the video light turns on before recording. You might want this if you're filming a blooming flower over the course of many days, or you're shooting construction at night. You don't want the light on constantly draining power or interrupting your environment. It is important to note, this function only works if you have a compatible light mounted to the MI shoe. Where this feature really sings is when we add in the Auto ND. Let's pretend that we're shooting a sunrise or sunset. By turning on Auto ND before you record, the camera will automatically add in or pull out the ND as the scene plays out. This way you can leave your iris shutter and ISO untouched. 
You can adjust the automatic exposure level quickly by selecting in on the multifunction dial from the home screen on your viewfinder. Once you've seen the gold box, scroll until you are on the AE indicator. Select in and toggle until you have chosen how many stops over or under you would like the camera to adjust to. So we're doing a take? Yes. Okay. Cache recording can be such an awesome tool, especially in high frame rate and documentary situations. Cache Record allows you to capture video retroactively when you start recording and then record it to your media by maintaining an internal cache memory. Basically, when you're in cache record mode, the camera has a small amount of internal memory that it uses to constantly record in the background. When it runs out of space, it starts to eat its own tail to make room for the new information. When you push record, the camera begins putting information onto the media, including whatever it was recording prior to the button push. After you end the recording, the camera wraps it all up into a nice video file. My favorite story is about a documentary filmmaker with an FX9 on a boat somewhere cold. They had a finite amount of media, had to shoot in high frame rate, and were tasked with capturing a killer whale breaching. As you can imagine, this poor DP cannot predict the future, so they relied solely on cache record. Just after the whale broke the surface of the water, they pushed record, and the camera captured everything, including five seconds before they pressed record, before the whale even breached the surface. To put your camera into cache record, we go to Menu, then Project, and Picture Cache Record. Scroll to Setting to enable it. Then go to Cache Rec Time to set your time for accumulation of images in the cache memory. We are shooting at XAVCI in full frame 4096 mode with a frequency of 2398. We can cache up to eight seconds. It is important to plan this before you shoot as different frequencies and different resolutions will give you more or less cache time. The longest amount of cache time is 28 seconds if you shoot an XAVCL, 3840 and 2398, or XAVCI, 1080 at 2398. The way that cameras generate clips are not perfectly layered together while it's recording. When you push record, the camera starts taking in information and just getting it into the bank. Things like color space, resolution, 24 frames per second, maybe some audio. It's just trying to collect everything as quickly as possible. When you push record to end the clip, the camera closes itself up, neatly collects and layers all the data and puts it into a nice wrapper so that we can then play it back. But what happens when we disrupt that last button push? The most common mistake is that the camera loses battery in the middle of a recording. When that happens, after the camera reboots, a prompt appears that says media needs to be restored. Restore media A now? Our two options are cancel and execute. Execute sounds like a scary word, so many assistants cancel their store for fear of accidentally losing the entire card, when in reality, the camera goes into safety mode and just closes itself in a bubble to protect all the data it just collected. When power is restored, the camera is asking us, do you want me to deal with all this stuff? And we say, yes, please, and we hit execute. This will trigger the camera to close out the file safely and collect and layer all the data into a nicely wrapped clip. If you were shooting a three minute clip, it may take about three minutes to restore. If you were shooting a longer clip, it can take a little longer to restore. If you are unsure, remove the media from circulation and after you wrap, just put the card back in the camera and let the clip restore. It is strongly recommended to use the same camera that was used to shoot the clip. Finally, the XDCA. With this, we can use V-mounts, we can output RAW to an external recorder, it has power outputs like DTAP for accessories, and there's slot in wireless audio. There are additional reference and time code out connections, two USB connectors for wireless dongles, as well as an RJ45 connector that allows for RCP control and network functionality. I got, I got to the end. I did it the first time. Come in. I added a word, but I thought it was fine. Okay, let's just cut it because this is not happening. I hope this wasn't as hard to watch as it was for me to say. Make sure you check out the other 101s on Sony EDU and go to sonycine.com for other videos and resources. As the great Dan Perry says, a rising tide lifts all boats. Felt good, nailed it, cut it, move on. Ugh.